Hello everybody, my name is Pedro Volpiani, I'm a mechanical engineer and I did my PhD and my postdoc in compressible and reactive flows. This is the first lecture of a series about compressible flows. Don't forget to follow the channel if you like the video. Since the development of the first airplane, men have the desire to fly faster. The first aircraft to fly at supersonic speeds was a Bell X-1 rocket-powered research plane flown by Chuck Eager from the US Air Force a feat he accomplished in October 1947. After being dropped from the belly of a mothership airplane, the XS-1 attained a top speed of 1,126 km per hour or Mach 1.06. The first supersonic transport was the Soviet Tupolev Tu-144, which had its first supersonic flight in June 1969 and began flying mail between Moscow and Alma-Ata in 1975. The first supersonic passenger carrying commercial airplane, the Concorde, was jointly developed and manufactured by aircraft manufacturers in Great Britain and France. It made its first transatlantic crossing in 1973 and entered regular services in 1976. It continued flying for the next 27 years until British Airways and Air France decided to stop the service due to high costs in 2003. The Concorde had a maximum speed over twice the speed of sound, at Mach 2.04. We cannot forget to mention the experimental X-15 hypersonic airplane, which achieved Mach 7 in 1963, and finally the Space Shuttle, the ultimate in manned airplanes with its Mach 25 re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. This is an introductory course on compressible flows, and a basic knowledge on fluid mechanics is recommended to follow this course. First of all, before starting our course, let's define some variables. Rho stands for the density. V denotes the specific volume of the gas, or the volume per unit of mass. Ui is the velocity vector. P is the pressure. T, the temperature. M, the dynamic viscosity. And E, the total energy per unit mass. E is formed by the intrinsic internal energy manifested by the motion of the molecules within the system, the kinetic energy represented by the movement of the system as a whole, and the potential energy caused by the position of the system in a field of gravity. This last term is often neglected since the fluid is a gas at high velocities. No other types of energy will be addressed in this course, such as dissociation energy. In a high-speed flow, the kinetic energy of a fluid particle is extremely large. When high-speed flows are slowed down, the reduction in kinetic energy appears as a substantial increase in temperature. As a result, high-speed flows, compressibility, and energy chains are all linked. Therefore, to study compressible flows, we must first examine some of the fundamentals of energy chains in a gas and the consequent response of pressure and temperature to these energy changes. Such fundamentals are the essence of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics tells that in a stationary system, the only means by which the internal energy can be increased are the following. 1. By adding heat to the system. This heat comes from the surroundings and is added to the system across the boundary. Let delta Q be an incremental amount of heat added per unit mass. Or 2. Through work done on the system. This work can be manifested by the boundary of the system being pushed out, work done by the system, or pushed in, work done on the system. Let delta W be an incremental amount of work done by the system per unit mass. Also, let DE int be the corresponding change in internal energy per unit mass. Then, simply on the basis of an empirical observation, confirmed by laboratory results, we can write DE int equal delta Q minus delta W. The first law of thermodynamics states that the change in the internal energy of a closed system is equal to the amount of heat supplied to the system minus the amount of work done by the system on its surroundings. The reversible work done by pressure forces during a change of volume for a stationary system equals PdV. The product PdV must be seen here as the product of the pressure by elementary surface of the fluid element, which corresponds to the force exerted on this element itself multiplied by the displacement of the element, to translate the work of this force. 
it's convenient to define the property entropy as the sum e int plus pv. In differential form, we obtain these expressions. Other examples of defined properties are the specific heats at constant pressure, Cp, and constant volume, Cv. Consider a system to which a small amount of heat is added. The addition of dq will cause a small change in temperature, dt, of the system. By definition, specific heat is the heat added per unit change in temperature of the system. However, for a fixed quantity dq, the resulting value of dt can be different depending on the type of process in which dq is added. We'll be interested in only two types of specific heat, one at constant volume and the other at constant pressure. Consider a gas inside a rigid boundary. In this case, the volume of the system always remains constant. If an amount of heat dq is added to the system, p and t will change. This is a constant volume process. Now, consider a gas inside a cylinder piston arrangement. When dq is added to the system, t and v, hence rho, will change, but not p. This is a constant pressure process. If the heat dq is added at constant volume and it causes a change in temperature dt, the specific heat at constant volume cv is defined as partial e int partial t, since in a constant volume process dq equal d e int. On the other hand, if dq is added at constant pressure and it causes a change in temperature dt, whose value is different from the previous one, the specific heat at constant pressure cp is defined as partial h partial t, since in isobaric process dq equals dh. Consider a particle system that exchanges energy with its environment. This exchange process is said to be reversible if it can be inverted so that the particle system and its environment return to their original state. It is clear that there is no real process that is perfectly reversible. In particular, all real fluid flows undergo the irreversible effects of viscous friction and heat transfer. However, if you consider a fluid element located outside the boundary layer zone in which most of the effects of viscosity and thermal conductivity occur, and in the absence of shock waves in the flow, we can estimate that the evolution of this element is practically reversible. The second law of thermodynamics will allow us to specify in which direction the evolution of the state of a thermodynamic system can be made and to quantify the degree of irreversibility of a process. The second principle of thermodynamics states that 1. There exists a state variable S, called entropy, which is given for a reversible process by the relation dq over t. Combining the first law with the definition of entropy, we obtain the Gibbs relation, including the temperature, entropy, internal energy, pressure, and density. 2. Any change of state of a thermodynamic system is accompanied by a variation of entropy ds, which is decomposed as dq over t reversible plus ds irreversible, where the last term comes from the irreversible process like viscous friction, heat transfer, shock, which occur in a system and is such that it is greater than zero. Then, for any diabetic process occurring without heat exchange, ds is greater than zero. And for any reversible adiabatic process, ds equals zero. Such process is called isentropic since it is done with constant entropy. Let's now take a step back and look at the equations that have been established to describe a flow. Let's focus on the unknown variables that appear in these equations. The conservation equation of mass involves the density rho and the velocity vector u. The equation of momentum involves the as unknown variables rho, u, and the pressure, p. The viscous stress tensor depends on the velocity vector through the gradients of its components and on the viscosity mu, assumed to be known. The conservation equation of energy again involves rho, u, p, but also the specific total energy, e, or equivalently, the internal energy, e int, as well as the temperature, t, through the conductive heat. The thermal conductivity kappa is assumed to be known. We thus have five scalar equations for seven unknowns 
that are a priori independent. It's clear that to solve these equations, we need additional relations to connect some of these unknowns with each other. It is the thermodynamics that will provide us with these relations, called equations of state. Let's now describe the equations of state of a calorically perfect gas. Density, pressure, temperature, and internal energy are state variables that characterize the equilibrium state of a thermodynamic system. An equilibrium thermodynamic system is characterized by two independent state variables, and all state variables can be determined from these two known state variables, using state equations. Then, two state equations allow us to change the number of unknown state variables from 4 to 2 in the equations governing the fluid dynamics. In this way, we solve five partial differential equations involving five unknowns. This resolution is certainly difficult in the general case, but it becomes possible. In this course, air will be considered as a perfect gas, a gas in which the intermolecular forces are neglected. The macroscopic properties of this perfect gas model provide a very good approximation of the properties of a real gas, except for very low and very high temperatures and densities. The perfect gas equation of state is written as P equals rho RT where R is a gas constant, with capital R being the un universal constant of perfect gases and capital M the molar mass of the gas considered. Under normal conditions of temperature and pressure, R equals 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The internal energy is a state variable that can be connected to rho T or V T by the so-called heating state equation. One can then write the differential relation expressing the variation of internal energy as a function of the elementary variations of temperature and specific volume. It can be shown that for a perfect gas, the internal energy and the enthalpy are functions of temperature only. This is very important because we can make useful simplifications for such gases. Consider the specific heat at constant volume, Cv. If the internal energy is only temperature dependent, it does not matter whether the volume is held constant when computing CV. Thus, the partial derivative becomes an ordinary derivative, and we can write d int equals CV dt. Similarly, for the specific heat at constant pressure, we can write for a perfect gas dH equals Cp dt. If we let e int be zero when the temperature equals zero Kelvin, then from the definition of enthalpy, H also equals zero when T equals zero Kelvin. The previous equations can now be rewritten as E int equals CVT and H equals CPT. We can now derive the my relation. It says that CP minus CV equals R. Since CP and CV are constant, we can introduce a new coefficient gamma ratio of these specific heats. For air flows in which the temperature does not exceed 600 Kelvin, the coefficient gamma remains constant and equals to 1.4. We can also derive the following expressions for CV and CP. And the equation of state can be expressed as P equals gamma minus 1 rho e int. In the case of an isentropic flow of perfect gas, we can write the Gibbs relation by using the thermal state law P equals rho RT and the heat state law d e int equals CV dt and obtain ds equals cv dt over t plus r dv over v. This relation can be integrated between two states, 1 and 2. Applying the state law for both states, we know that t2 over t1 equals p2 rho 1 over p1 rho 2, and we deduce the following equation. Using my relation cp minus cv equals r, and by introducing the ratio gamma of specific heats, we obtain the following expression. An isentropic flow of perfect gas is therefore such that P over rho gamma equals constant, leading to the final equation. These relations are valid in an isentropic compressible flow. For example, consider the flow around an airfoil without discontinuities, shock for instance, and outside the boundary layer and wake zones. Imagine a fluid element moving along one of these streamlines. There is no heat being added or taken away from this fluid element. Thus, 
the flow of the fluid element along the streamline is adiabatic. In this region, friction can also be neglected. Hence, the flow of the fluid element is both adiabatic and reversible. That means the flow is isentropic. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to visit my website for more videos and exercises. See you in the next lecture.